What is the truth? Can everything be reduced to a number? What's happened with respect to the use of opioids over the course of, say, 1980 to 2002, we've seen an over than 200% increase in the use of opioids for patients with non-malignant pain. Unfortunately, that's also led to an increase in the abuse, misuse, and diversion of opioids. We've been saying since the beginning of this opioid revolution that when a doctor's treating somebody with controlled substances, that they need to be, in the words of Doug Gourley, a talented amateur in addiction medicine. One of the mistakes that, uh, that we've made in approaching pain and addiction is to think for even a moment that the two are independent one of another. The biology of chronic pain is not the biology of acute pain. A fracture can heal, but the pain can continue for months and even years. One of the issues about uh, chronic pain patients is they tend to be extremely complex. And I don't think there's one single answer to the treatment of pain. And I think we have to always talk about a multimodal, multidisciplinary approach when we're talking about these chronic pain patients. How will the patient-provider relationship be impacted if absolute rules are enacted and no individual distinctions are permitted? So everybody's different, everybody responds differently, it's individualized. Since we have no scientific basis for the precise measurement of pain, exactly how will the line between moderate and severe chronic non-cancer pain be determined? I think probably one of the biggest things that the primary care provider or the primary care practice can do that we don't do enough of is the appropriate screening for psychiatric comorbidities in our chronic pain population. As prescribers who treat people with chronic pain, we are on the front line. Patients have legitimate concerns. Every provider will have to set personal practice limits with rules and agreements without denying patients access to pain relief. I think it's important to start at the beginning and screen patients for indicators that could be suggestive of abuse and misuse and diversion and unintentional use and so forth. I think patient education is key. I tell them you store your medicine like your money. You don't keep your money on the kitchen table, you don't leave your medicine on the kitchen table. What is the role of government in this debate? Are new guidelines based solely on numbers? In light of the increase in morbidity and mortality associated with prescription opioids, there's been an awful lot of legislative reaction. As a result, an awful lot of legislation and new regulation. But at the same time, there has not been that much talk about balance. And that is essential in pain treatment policy, is that you want to ensure access while at the same time preventing abuse. So it has become quite a challenge. Can everything be reduced to a number? Well, one thing we say in medicine is don't be first and try not to be last. And I think the same wisdom applies to a drug like uh, the opioid class of medications. Opioids clearly work or we wouldn't use them. What is the truth? <laughs>